Tonight, a hearing connected to one of the most important court cases in American history, taking one strange turn after another. Cash, caviar, and the phrase, a man is not a plan. All part of testimony today, with the key question being, what exactly is a romantic relationship? The high stakes battle in a Georgia courtroom, DA Fonnie Willis defending her conduct in a relationship with the special prosecutor she appointed in the Trump election interference case. Her fiery exchanges as a special prosecutor, Nathan Wade, is grilled on his finances. Bombshell testimony refuting Willis and Wade's claims that their relationship started after he was hired. What we know about a potential ruling and the major implications for the Trump election interference case. Also tonight, Trump trial date set. A judge clearing the way for the first criminal trial of a former president. The case stemming from hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The former president slamming the decision, saying he'll be in court by day and campaigning by night just as the election heats up. Kansas City reeling from a mass shooting after the Chiefs Super Bowl parade. A beloved local radio DJ killed and nearly two dozen others injured, including many children. The new video investigators are combing through to piece it all together. Russia space weapon? New details emerging after an alarming announcement about a national security threat. The capabilities of Russia's new anti-satellite weapon reaching the cosmos, but also back here on Earth? In California, a powerful explosion rocking an L.A. neighborhood. Nine firefighters injured, two of them critically, what authorities say caused this blast. Plus, Paul McCartney's long-lost guitar has been found, the beloved bass missing for more than five decades, now back where it belongs. And good evening. There's only one way to describe this. Fireworks in a Georgia courtroom. A high stakes and hostile hearing as Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis takes the stand defending her conduct in the Trump election interference case. Attorneys for the co-defendants in that case arguing that Willis's romantic relationship with the special prosecutor she appointed created a conflict of interest. The judge weighing in if evidence in this hearing merits Willis and Wade's disqualification throwing the entire case, such an important case, into limbo. Dramatic moments as Willis takes the stand, entering the courtroom saying she wants to, quote, go, and she definitely went at it. This it, is, it, it is a lot. It is, it is a lot. I tried to implicate and slept with him at that conference, which I find to be extremely offensive. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. A defiant Fonnie Willis punching back, as you heard there, at every question thrown her way, attacking the defense every second she gets. The judge giving her a stern warning, telling her to answer questions directly. It's going to be my first time I have to caution you. We have to listen to the questions as asked. And if this happens again and again, I'm going to have no choice but to strike your testimony. The special prosecutor at the heart of these allegations also taking the stand. The defense pressing Nathan Wade, trying to prove that their relationship benefited them financially. Lawyers casting doubt that Willis repaid Wade for expensive vacations and dinners with cash. You don't have a single solitary deposit slip to corroborate or support any of your allegations that you were paid by Mrs. Willis in cash, do you? No, sir. Not a single solitary one. Not a one. Not a one. And it's not just their finances being questioned, but when their relationship started. Bombshell testimony from a key witness poking holes at both Willis and Wade's testimony. They say the relationship began in early 2022 after Wade was appointed. But a former DA office employee and longtime friend of Willis says otherwise. You have no doubt that their romantic relationship was in effect from 2019 until the last time you spoke with her. No doubt. We're breaking down all the heated moments in the courtroom and the wide-scale implications this hearing could have on the Trump election interference case. But first, we want to start with NBC's Blaine Alexander, who's covering it all for us. She is the high-profile face of the prosecution against former President Trump in the Georgia election interference case. Fonny, F-A-N-I, 
Last name is Willis. Mm -hmm. But late today, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis herself took the witness stand. And I've been very anxious to have this conversation with him today. So I ran to the courtroom. In an often contentious back and forth. It, it, it is a lot. It is a lot. Willis was pressed about details of her personal relationship with Nathan Wade, who she hired as special prosecutor on the Trump case. You and Mr. Wade met in October 2019 at a conference? That is correct. And I think in one of your motions, you tried to implicate and slept with him at that conference, which I find to be extremely offensive. Willis's testimony was a shocking twist in a fiery evidentiary hearing that focused on allegations that Willis financially benefited from her personal relationship with Wade in the form of romantic getaways. Allegations first made by Trump co-defendant Michael Roman and his attorney, Ashley Merchant, in an effort to get Willis removed as prosecutor, a move that would throw the entire Georgia case against Mr. Trump into question. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. At issue, who paid for vacations the two took together? Wade and Willis both testified they split costs evenly, or she reimbursed him. You never wrote him a check? Ma'am, I don't have checks. When pressed for evidence, Willis said she used cash. For many, many years, I have kept money in my house. I don't need anything from a man. A man is not a plan. A man is a companion. And so there was tension always in our relationship, which is why I was give him his money back. I don't need anybody to foot my bills. Both Wade and Willis have acknowledged a personal relationship. The question, when it began, before or after she hired him on the Trump case in November of 2021. Today, a longtime friend of Willis and former employee testified that relationships started well before then. You have no doubt that their romantic relationship was in effect from 2019 until the last time you spoke with her. No doubt. And later, when pressed by Trump attorney Steve Sadow. Did you observe them do things that are uh, common among people having a romantic relationship? Yes. Such as, can you give us an example? Hugging, kissing, disaffection. All, of, all before November 1st of 2021, correct? Yes. But Willis took exception. I certainly do not consider her a friend now. Um, I think that she, you know, there's a saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And um, I think that she betrayed our friendship. Willis says she and Wade started dating in early 2022 after she hired him. It's the same timeline he swore to in an affidavit and testified to today. Let's be clear. 2022 was the start of any intimate sexual relationship with the district attorney. And with that, Blaine Alexander joins us live tonight from Atlanta. Blaine, this was such a momentous day in this case, and it was really incredible to watch this play out. You've been covering this for us from the get-go. Talk to us about the moment when Fonnie Willis decided to take the stand, because before it happened, there were some questions about whether she would testify at all. You know what, Tom, at the very second that she walked into the courtroom, her own attorneys were arguing to keep her off the witness stand. Remember, she had filed a motion to quash her subpoena. She had filed a motion to stop the entire hearing from happening. And so even though she had been called to the stand, her attorneys were actively arguing to keep her off. But then her security came in first, and then Fonnie Willis strode in after them. And she basically said, knock it all down. I'm dismissing that. I want to take the stand. And it was a surprise to everyone in the room, everyone who was watching, and certainly her legal team as well. It was an incredibly compelling moment for her to take on all the allegations head on there. What happens tomorrow, and when could we get a ruling in this case? Well, she's back on the stand tomorrow. We do know that there's some more testimony there. But remember, her team has their own witnesses to call. So we expect that to take about four or five hours. We know that Fonnie Willis's father, for instance, is going to be one of the people who's called to the stand by Anna Cross on her team. Now, as for when we get a ruling, it's not going to happen this week. We certainly don't expect that. The hearing's going to go through tomorrow, possibly even early into next week, Tom. And the judge has made it clear he's not going to rule from the bench. So what's going to happen is after the hearing's done, he's going to go back, consider the evidence, and then issue a written ruling at some point in the days to come.
Arkansas. You know, Blaine, when we started the broadcast, I said this was a hearing connected to one of the most important court cases in modern American history, right? We have the president being accused yes. of trying to steal an election. We can't forget that. And, and I want you to remind our viewers, there, there have already been multiple defendants who have pleaded guilty to these allegations, right, to these charges. Yeah, absolutely. It started with 19. Four of them have pleaded guilty already. And so, but, you know, this still kind of leaves a hefty chunk of defendants left to try. So the hanging questions here are, one, when will the trial date be? Fonnie Willis wants it to be mid-August. Everybody, all the defendants are pushing back against that. And then the other question is, will they be tried together? That's something that the DA wants to see. Or will they be severed? Will we see a number of separate trials? So certainly a long time before we see any sort of resolution in this. And then, of course, the big question, will she stay on? the case or right. how will the judge rule there a um, lot of drama in the courtroom but we can't lose sight of what it's all connected to okay uh blaine alexander we thank you for all that to break it down all the big moments from today's hearing i want to bring in our legal eagles tonight nbc news legal analysts angela senadella and danny savalos and Catherine christian a former assistant district attorney in the manhattan da's office and also an nbc news legal analyst we thank you all for being here tonight okay as the former assistant da i, I want to start with you was it a good idea for da fonnie willis to take the Stand. After seeing the result, yes. When I first saw her in the well, I was like, what is she doing? And then when she took the stand and basically owned it, basically she was saying, I'm the boss, I'm the DA, I'm going to, you know, the buck stops with me, I'm going to own this. And she also, you know, we here in Manhattan, like, oh, she's speaking too much. She's Fulton County, Georgia. She was elected by the Fulton County electorate. She was speaking to Fulton County jurors. This is who she was. If she was very, very credible, and basically the judge, even though he said, I'm going to strike your testimony, let her run the courtroom and just say and then run over the defense attorneys. Angela, on this same question, there's, there's a little piece of advice uh, that, that I like to live by, which is extreme emotion will eviscerate your dreams, right? And it seemed like Fonnie Willis's attorneys were, were asking, were trying to make sure she wouldn't testify. She comes out of nowhere, and she was definitely fired up. Is it smart to take the stand in that in that sort of headspace? So look, it was a huge risk, but I think it paid off because she came in and she dominated that courtroom. I thought she took control. She walked in there and she said, this is my case. This is my trial. And I thought she had great arguments where I thought Nathan Wade maybe was a little light. So I felt she made up some gaps that Nathan Wade left. Let's go to the beginning of the day and what started here. Fonnie Willis is a former friend who she later rented an apartment from, who actually worked for her as well, uh, testified in this case. Here's what she said about the relationship before Wade's appointment as special prosecutor. You have no doubt that their romantic relationship was in effect from 2019 until the last time you spoke with her? No doubt. Okay. And that's based on your personal observations and, obser and you know speaking with them and seeing them together and things like that? Yes. This is one of the issues, Danny, that's at the heart of this case, right? Explain to our viewers, if you testify today in this hearing, you were under oath, correct? Absolutely. So if she lied, if, if Fonnie Willis's former friend was lying there, she would go to jail? Not automatically. Perjury probably happens every day, 100 times a day in every courthouse. It is very rarely actually prosecuted. And by the way, you may not ever get to a certainty that she committed perjury. You ask about that witness committing perjury. It's also equally as possible that other witnesses today could have committed perjury as well. And what really happens in life and in court is you never really find out who was telling the truth. You just decide someone was more credible than the other. But my question being, she'd have to have a motivation if she was not telling the truth. And she stood by her word there. How damaging of a moment was that? It was somewhat damaging, but at the same time, it's one witness with a cred some credibility issues. Uh, she had, you know, had some disciplinary problems at the DA's office. I thought they did a good job of exposing that she might have had some motive to fabricate. But look, it's just one witness, and you can take the credibility of the witness or not take the credibility. I mean, credibility determinations are really not the same as perjury. And, you know, ultimately, the same thing applies to DA Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. The judge could ultimately conclude that they were not credible as well. And look, I got to tell you something. I'm thinking I'm probably in the minority, uh, especially with my dear friends here, uh, Angela and Catherine. I don't think that DA Fonnie Willis did a great job as a witness, and I mean that technically. Uh, but ultimately, in terms of speaking to her constituents, and in that sense, I agree with Catherine, in, in terms of sending a message, because we've been playing sound of her testifying, and it's uh, really compelling speech. If this were an interview 
on television, right. but it's not. And all I have to say is this. We're gonna, yeah. However compelling it is, you go back to a few seconds before, and she wasn't answering the question asked. So all I would say well, is... We're, and we're going to get there, Danny. Yeah, yeah, we're okay. going to get there. we got like 30 questions. We're going to get there. Angela, but Danny brings up a good point. Um, who, who are you playing to here? Because you're not playing to a jury. I mean, maybe you're playing to your constituents, but ultimately in this case today, aren't you playing to the judge? Okay, so you're right, but also I understand what Danny's saying. The judge will make the determination on credibility and decide whether or not these two people get kicked off the case. But at the same time, the jury pool is watching. The whole public is watching. So the future of their case will depend on what they think of those prosecutors. So there were really two issues at play here, right, guys? Did they have a relationship before Wade's appointment, a special prosecutor? And did he use funds from that appointment to take Willis on vacations. Here's how Wade explained how those trips were paid for. So all of the vacations that she took, she paid you cash for? Yes, ma'am. You don't have a single solitary deposit slip to corroborate or support any of your allegations that you were paid by Mrs. Willis in cash, do you? No, sir. Not a single solitary one? Not a one. And D.A. Willis also addressed her use of cash during her testimony. What I'm telling you is that throughout the course of my life, I have always kept cash in my house. So, Catherine, is that explanation going to hold up? Oh, coming from her, yes, because the way she said it about her father, her daddy, telling her to always keep cash, how she uses cash app and cash. So she was very credible on that. I use credit cards. She uses cash. So when I her explanation... It was believable to but me. But the defense, and when I say the defense, the, the, the attorneys for the co-defendants were trying to kind of hammer, right? They said, well, you paid, you used cash apps to pay your rent, but you didn't use cash apps to pay Nathan Wade. She said Nathan Wade doesn't use cash apps. That, that all adds up? Yes. I mean, they obviously are arguing she did that, and there are no receipts to hide the fact of all the money. But it was completely credible from what she was saying, particularly when she was talking about her life and her father's wisdom to her about cash. Danny, what do you think about those exchanges? I can't help but think if Catherine, who has tried... Dozens more cases than I ever will, and knows, has forgotten more about trial practice than I ever will, but, uh, than I'll ever know, rather. Uh, I have to imagine if she was prosecuting an economics crimes case, and there's a witness on the stand that says, oh, it just so happens I have no record whatsoever because I paid all this critically important issue, all of it I paid in cash, there's no record, fortunately for me, absolutely no way to track it down. Very convenient. This, a lot of folks are framing this as, there's nothing wrong with keeping cash in your house. I agree. You can pay for everything with cash. We all know people who do that. Although, respectfully... Senator Bob Menendez is claiming that he, that he it, does the same thing. Well, then you're yeah. kind of you're making my point for me. Yeah. But uh, look, if you want to argue that keeping cash in the home is a great idea, that's not what this is about. This is about, it happened to be unbelievably convenient that this particular transaction, paying someone back for vacations, was made with cash. So now, magically, there's just no record of it. And then, as a secondary issue, you may decide, by the way, that it's credible that after two uh, people in a romantic relationship go on a cruise, that there's some meeting where someone thumbs off a wad of sweaty cash from an envelope and hands it over to their paramour. It doesn't seem realistic to me, but look, that's ultimately for Judge McAfee to decide if he finds it credible. If you went on a first date once, Tom, and handed a wad of cash and exchanged cash back and forth or went Dutch or whatever it is, yeah. maybe you find that credible. I don't. Applebee's gift card. That's how I go on a date. Also um, the, yeah, wait on this one, Angela. The burden of proof here is on the defense to prove that this is not credible. And so to the extent that she did have a believable explanation, the judge has to weigh those. But the burden of proof is on the defendants. Catherine, you know, as a former assistant DA, I was listening to this, and DA Fonnie Willis is a public servant. And there was a lot of discussions about cruise after cruise and Napa and caviar and cash and this and that. That's got to affect her in some way. People are allowed to go on vacation, don't get me wrong, but as a public servant, do you think that's going to hurt her? No, it's not going to hurt her. I, I tell you, I, I didn't do all of that, but I had colleagues who had the same salary I did, and they took wonderful vacations and had cars and had second homes. So people have different lives. Uh, I think, you know, there's a, two things can be true at the same time. One, this was the appearance of impropriety, bad lapse of judgment. I think he should be off this case. But there Nathan was, Wade. Yes, okay. he should not be on Why? this case Why? anymore. Just the appearance of impropriety. It will be, and I don't think she will be disqualified and the office will be disqualified, that his continued presence will keep this issue alive. He is not, 
She has the expert in RICO in the country on the trial team. Anna Cross is a, a very excellent attorney. His presence on this team is not necessary and is an unnecessary distraction. I want to go back to that moment we played earlier in the broadcast when the judge admonishes Fonnie Willis for the way she was answering some of the questions. Let's roll that soundbite, please. It's going to be my first time out to caution. We have to listen to the questions as asked. And if this happens again and again, I'm going to have no choice but to strike your testimony. Danny, I want to come to you with this one, because you, you made this point earlier. I was listening to you. She sort of had a, a strategy with the way she was answering questions, right? She seemed to have total recall when she could take the question head on, and then at other times when it was a tough question, there was, oh, I don't remember, there was a little bit of sort of side talk. Talk to me about what happened there. I hear a lot of folks saying she came out swinging, she fought back. And you know what? That's great if you're giving a speech or giving an interview. But I have to believe that every attorney who thinks she did a great job, I would ask, look, uh, Catherine, if you, would you tolerate a witness not answering your questions the way this witness did? And actually, I heard Catherine make a very good point, which was the defense attorneys didn't ask the proper leading questions. There's a way to ask and limit the witness to a yes or no answer. And really, the defense attorneys could have done a better job in that area. But in terms of a witness testifying, and this is no ordinary witness, this is the elected DA of Fulton County. She wasn't following the rules of evidence. She got away with it, and you know what? She took a chance, and it probably saved the day for her. Because you're right, she did get a message across. But if I was evaluating this strictly by the rules of evidence and what my good friends here would tolerate if they were cross-examining a witness, there's no way. There's no way Catherine would tolerate it. There's no way Angela yeah. would tolerate someone answering every other question but the question Who that was, was asked. Who was in control in that courtroom? Because I felt when D.A. Fonnie Willis came in, she was in control. The DA, even even more than the judge. But that's I mean, not the, the, judge, the judge seemed to be afraid of her at, at, at one point he before was. he finally said that. Yes. Talk, talk to me about that. Yes. that. That's unusual. She was in control, and Danny is right. I would not, first of all, if I was the defense attorney, yes, she was their witness, I would not be asking open-ended questions yep. so she can just roll over them. She rolled over the attorneys. She yep. rolled over the judge. There was one point is that he, normal? One point that he happened? said, I might have to strike your testimony, and then didn't. Yep. It's not normal, but think of the, there is a power dynamic. Yes, she's the judge, he's yeah. in control. She's the DA. Right. Um, what did you think about Ashley Merchant, right? Because she's the one who brought this entire hearing together. She's the one to make the first allegation to get to this point. But at times, she seemed to get dates wrong. She seemed to get numbers wrong. She seemed to kind of have a case, but, and again, I'm not an attorney, she didn't know how to prosecute it. I got the sense that she was surprised she made it this far, and she put up a good show. She did a lot of exploring. She threw a lot out there, but I did feel the other defense attorneys picked up a lot of the slack and were able to narrow down and hammer down far better than she did. That said, she is the one who got the ball rolling. You know, there was a lot of uh, important issues discussed, but a, a lot of times throughout this case, things got a little wacky. They got a little crazy. Uh, we have a clip of some of those moments now. I think we did two different wine tours that you do, which are pretty expensive. Um, I think I bought him. He likes wine. I don't really like wine, to be honest with you. I like Grey Goose. I don't need anybody to foot my bills. The only man who's ever foot my bills completely is my daddy. I don't want to discuss his personal business, but I'm happy Mr. Wade is still here with us. And I did 50 big, very big. Mr. Wade is used to women that, uh, as he told me one time, the only thing a woman can do for him is make him a sandwich. We would have brutal arguments about the fact that I am your equal. I don't need anything from a man. A man is not a plan. A man is a companion. You never wrote him a check? Ma'am, I don't have checks. Okay. So, Catherine, I mean, there were moments when I was, to be completely transparent, I, I mean, and everyone that was watching this was laughing out loud. Again, we had this conversation about, about who she's playing to here. Does this give her any points in this case? Definitely. It definitely. She, first of all, that's what made her credible. Just laying back, you know, I don't drink wine, I drink great goose. It was her being herself. And yes, the judge is making a decision, but you, as you can see, he clearly was letting her just do whatever she wanted to do in the courtroom today. Danny? Respectfully disagree. One of the classic signs, and I guess defense, criminal defense attorneys spend their entire career being lied to. I won't get into detail. You can guess who's doing the yeah. lying to us. But uh, <laughs> what happens is that, in my view, my experience, a classic sign of dissembling, of not telling the truth, is when you're asked one question 
and you give a long answer about the answer to another question. You saw all that stuff about Grey Goose. If you'd gone back seven minutes, the original question was probably something like, can you state your name for the record? Right. And Fonnie Willis would take whatever question and add in whatever details she wanted. And you notice, when it came to things that could get her in trouble, she had bad recall. Have you paid your tax liens? I uh, don't know. But when it comes to all the continents and countries that Nathan Wade has visited, oh, Six. she remembers that yeah. perfectly. Why? Zero risk whatsoever. Angela, is the bar to disqualify, I got to imagine it's very high. And did we reach that today? It's not actually that high. No? It's if okay. there's an appearance an of attorney. impropriety <laughs> of a conflict of interest and if she derived any financial benefit. And that's why we drilled down so deep today in what exactly did she pay for? How much cash did she give Nathan Wade? It sounds irrelevant, but what's important is did she pay her own way or did the taxpayers pay for her? But I, when I say... It, the bar's got to be high. I mean that the entire country's watching this case. It's really a case that involves an allegation the former president stole the election. So the judge, I have to think, Catherine, is going to weigh his decisions pretty seriously. And it didn't look like he was playing around at all in court today. No, and it is. It, there was no uh, actual conflict shown by, you know, any of the defense attorneys... Uh, any of the evidence, their, their star witness, unless they're going to have more, was the former friend, former employee. Uh, that, to me, is not enough. Yes, appearance of impropriety, bad judgment, and I still say he should be off the trial team, but there's no reason to disqualify the elected DA. Real quick, after today, because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, what do you think the judge would have ruled after today? I think he's going to rule that the defense did not meet their, meet their burden and DA Willis should not be disqualified. Danny? I actually agree. And so in that sense, Fonnie Willis's testimony will have been successful. I just don't think it was something that was uh, appropriate or proper at times. But look, if it wins the day, I guess by Angela. I agree. I think Fonnie Willis saved the day there. I don't think Nathan Wade did. And I think she came in and really made it happen. OK, guys, we're going to have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. Thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Appreciate it. The trial date set in another major legal case involving the former president. Donald Trump back in a New York courtroom today for that hush money case brought by Manhattan's district attorney. Trump asking a judge to dismiss it, but the judge denying the request. Laura Jarrett reports. The case that first made Donald Trump a criminal defendant, now the first to go to trial. A judge in Manhattan today rejecting Mr. Trump's bid to toss the case out, saying the trial will begin on March 25th. Sitting in court today by choice, the Republican frontrunner will soon be required to show up. The judge saying he expects the trial to last six weeks. A distraction, Mr. Trump argues, is aimed at trying to derail his presidential campaign. It's a very unfair situation. They want to keep me nice and busy so I can't campaign so hard. The judge today unpersuaded by Mr. Trump's defense team arguing they cannot adequately prepare for the trial in New York with all his other criminal cases still on the horizon, including a Florida trial over classified documents in May and his election interference case in Washington, still unscheduled. The crooks of the case in Manhattan, accusations of hush money paid to a porn star ahead of the 2016 election, falsely documented, prosecutors say, as a legal expense on the books of the Trump organization to hide it. We allege falsification of business records to the end of keeping information away from the electorate. Laura Jarrett, NBC News, New York. All right, moving now to the investigation to that deadly shooting following yesterday's Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Police now confirming that two juveniles are now in custody and that the whole thing appears to have started during a fight. Maggie Vespa is in Kansas City with the very latest. Tonight, investigators say the shooting that turned a day of celebration into one of mourning in Kansas City appears to have started with a fight. This appeared to be a dispute between several people that ended in gunfire. Police say two teenagers are in custody. No charges have been filed. We want to make sure that anyone that was responsible for yesterday is brought to justice. According to police, 23 people were shot. At least half the victims are younger than 16. The youngest, just eight years old. 43-year-old radio DJ Lisa Lopez Galvan was killed. She always put others before herself. Very giving individual. It's a big loss. Do you feel like it's hit you? It comes and goes. It comes and goes. Lopez Galvan was a huge Kansas City sports fan there yesterday with her 22 year old son Mark, who, along with her two nieces, was also shot but survived. 
She's just not a statistic. Lisa was a lot more than just a number. She was a very wholesome, very caring, very loving individual. Downtown Kansas City was brimming with Chiefs fans during Wednesday's Super Bowl celebration. This video obtained by TMZ Sports showing the moments gunfire rang out just as the festivities were ending. We're in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, there is gunshots. This desperate 911 call made by a mom and daughter hiding gun under a car. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Bystanders oh try to save this person's life and help injured children. Another bystander, Paul Contreras, says he helped tackle a person with a gun. Police have not yet confirmed whether that person was involved in the shooting. As I took him down, I seen the weapon, the gun fall to the ground. With Kansas City schools closed, the crowd was packed with children. Jacob Gooch and Emily Tavis went to the parade with their kids. They say they were just 15 feet from one shooter. He was shooting. It was kind of like he did like a circle kind of. You know, it wasn't like he just shot directly at somebody. Trying it, to hit everybody. I see, yeah. Gooch was shot in the ankle. Crawling must crawling like this. You fell. Yeah. Because you'd been shot in the ankle. Right. Tavis was shot in the leg. Their 13-year-old son, Jacob Jr., was hit in the foot. Just can't imagine, you know, my kids getting hurt and me being dead would be... <laughs> I just can't think about that, you know. All right, Maggie Vespa joins us tonight from Kansas City, Missouri. So, Maggie, almost two dozen people were injured in this shooting, and one of the sad things that came out last night was right. so many of them were children. Do we know how they're doing tonight? We've gotten some updates, Tom. Obviously, we talked to some families that have children that are out of the hospital, that last family there uh, included. But essentially, they said at least half of those close to two dozen were under the age of 16, right? We heard from some hospitals today, one hospital, one that also treats adults, telling us they have two people still in the ICU. And then the Children's Hospital here in Kansas City says they have three kids still hospitalized. But they tell us, Tom, those kids should survive their injuries, thankfully. That is Tom. great news. Okay, Maggie, thank you for that. Next tonight, to new details about a possible Russian military threat from space. U.S. officials saying it is a nuclear-powered satellite that could cause plenty of chaos across the country. NBC's Peter Alexander explains. Tonight, the White House confirmed that it's monitoring Russia's development of what it called a troubling anti-satellite capability, but cautioned it is not a threat to Americans. We are not talking about a weapon that can be used to attack human beings or cause physical destruction here on Earth. And tonight, NBC News has learned new details about that capability, that it's a Russian nuclear-powered space asset that could be weaponized, according to a U.S. official and a congressional official familiar with the intelligence. It is not a nuclear bomb that Russia is trying to send up in space. It is not an active capability, and it has not yet been deployed. Experts have said a nuclear-fueled satellite might be able to carry a high-powered jammer that could block out a wide array of communications and other signals. Today's revelations come just hours after the House Intelligence Committee chairman, Republican Mike Turner, issued a cryptic warning demanding the White House declassify intelligence about the unspecified threat. And today the White House met with House leaders about it. I've got great faith in uh, what the administration is currently doing to try to address this matter. In 2022, NBC News' cameras were the first ever allowed inside the U.S. Space Command in Colorado. General Stephen Whiting speaking to NBC's Tom Costello. We don't want there to be a war in space, but if others choose to uh, start a war there, we'll be ready. All of it is Russian President Vladimir Putin is raising eyebrows weighing in on the 2024 election, saying he would prefer President Biden over Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. Saying Biden is more experienced, more predictable. He is an old school politician. Mr. Trump calling that a compliment. The only president in the last five that hasn't given Russia anything is a president known as Donald J. Trump. And this rebuke from the White House. Mr. Putin should just stay out of our elections. Also tonight, NBC News has learned about a secret cyber attack that the U.S. recently conducted against an Iranian military ship. According to three U.S. officials, that ship had been collecting intelligence on cargo vessels in and around the Red Sea and sharing it with Iranian-backed Houthi rebels who then attacked those ships. The U.S. operation more than a week ago, Tom, was intended to prevent further Houthi attacks. Tom. Okay, Peter, thank you. Still ahead tonight, a powerful explosion in L.A., Dramatic video capturing the moment of that blast, which left nine firefighters injured. But authorities say triggered the explosion. Plus, the winter storm on the move in the Great Lakes, expected to drop inches of snow. Bill Karen standing by with the forecast. 
and a Detroit Pistons star, Isaiah Stewart, arrested for assaulting an opponent in the parking lot before a game. What we know about what went down. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Thursday night. All right, we're back now with the forecast and a storm system moving through the Great Lakes, dropping up to six inches of snow in some areas. Meanwhile, out west, a winter wallop, rain and mountain snow slamming parts of the region, making for dangerous driving conditions in the Sierras. Winter alerts now stretching from Washington to Wyoming. Let's get right over to NBC's Bill Me- to NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns. Bill, tell us what you're watching tonight. Uh, Three storms. Uh, The first one is racing through New England. Quick shot of snow heading through the region as we head through the uh, end of the rush hour. Areas from New York City southward is no big deal, but a quick inch of snow is possible for the rest of this evening. Mass Pike all the way up through areas of Vermont, New Hampshire, also through Maine. We're going to see lake effect snow kicking in, too, behind this. So the next storm is already coming out into the plains. It's going to combine. There's a little bit of snow here in South Dakota and areas in Nebraska. Notice the moisture increasing in South Texas. This storm is going to have a little more juice with it. So the snow footprint's going to be a little bigger. We should get a coating to an inch from St. Louis, Indianapolis, one to two inches, Columbus, the mountainous areas of West Virginia. And then Friday night, you'll wake up Saturday morning, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Philly. You haven't had a lot of snow this winter. This looks like to be about one to three inches for you when you wake up Saturday morning. New York City, probably about an inch. And then we've been talking all week long about what's going to happen on the West Coast. You just saw the pictures from the first storm that went through. Here's a huge one off the coast. And look at this. That's an atmospheric river, and this has its eyes set on Southern California this weekend. We're still expecting a chance of some significant flooding and mudslides, Tom, Saturday and especially Sunday. In a rough winter for California. Okay, Bill, thank you for that. Severe weather also causing a scary situation in, you guessed it, California. Mount Baldy, when we come back, new video showing the daring rescue to save six hikers who were stuck near the top of the mountain at 9,000 feet. How they were eventually saved after several hours. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feeding. We begin with the powerful gas explosion that injured several firefighters in L.A. Surveillance video, take a look. It shows a massive fireball, wow, erupting on a street in the Wilmington neighborhood. Officials say crews were responding to a burning truck when a compressed natural gas tank then exploded. Nine firefighters were hurt, including at least two in critical condition tonight. It is unclear what started the initial fire. Detroit Pistons star Isaiah Stewart arrested for allegedly assaulting Phoenix Suns' Drew Eubanks. In a statement, Phoenix police say Stewart punched Eubanks in an arena parking lot before yesterday's game. The Suns called the attack, quote, unprovoked. Eubanks was okay and played in the game. Stewart was issued a citation and released, but was already out of the game for an injury. We've reached out to the players' reps for comment, but have not heard back just yet. Colorado police and the FBI are looking for a portrait of George Washington that's believed to be more than 200 years old. Authorities say the painting was stolen from a storage unit in Inglewood in January. It measures 24 by 30 inches and is inside a gold frame. Authorities say the painting dates back to the early 1800s and is a family heirloom. They have not released the item's value just yet. And a heroin rescue after six hikers found themselves trapped on California's Mount Mount Baldy. New video shows the hikers in a line walking towards the rescue helicopter before being airlifted to safety. The ground had become strand. The group had become stranded at 9,000 feet due to weather conditions. After several hours, they called 911 and were hoisted onto the chopper. They are expected to be okay. Okay, time now for the Americas, where Venezuela's government ordered the local UN office on human rights to suspend operations, giving staff just 72 hours to leave, and accusing the office of promoting opposition to the country. The announcement coming after prominent human rights attorney Rocio San Miguel was detained last week on charges of conspiracy against President Maduro. The U.N. has called out Maduro over the years for his human rights abuses and the deaths of dissidents and protesters. San Miguel's detainment sparking outrage from human rights groups in Venezuela, demanding for her release and expressing concern over government repression. Marissa Parra joins us tonight from Miami to break this down and other news out of Venezuela that's important. So, Marissa, let's start here. What's the latest tonight and do we know why the Venezuelan government decided to make this move? 
Hey, Tom, well, you mentioned some important context there. Uh, we have this human rights lawyer, San Miguel, who was detained, among others, at the airport this past weekend. So then today, Venezuela announced their decision at a news conference at the Capitol, saying that their local U.N. office had 72 hours to completely suspend their operations. So um, the office, they said, uh, they accused the office of being used by the international community against Venezuela, saying, quote, they had a colonialist attitude that was abusive and in violation of the Charter of the United Nations. Um, back to San Miguel, Venezuela is accusing the lawyer of being a part of an alleged plot to kill Maduro. This is a plot they're calling the White Bracelet plot. Um, and so she is now facing charges of treason, of conspiracy, of terrorism. And so her arrest followed an already tumultuous few weeks among opposition party members. We're talking about civilians. We're talking about members of the military. And so um, following those arrests, as well as, of course, this very high profile detainment with San Miguel, the United Nations had expressed concern. They had called for her immediate release and asked for the right to due process. And here we are just days later, Tom, just days later with an order from the government to suspend their Venezuelan office completely. So, Marissa, I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Maduro and his government is accusing the human rights attorney of, of mm -hmm. trying to assassinate Maduro? Correct. Of uh, being a part of this white bracelet plot. Have, exactly. have they provided any proof whatsoever? That's a great question. And so far, there is not extensive proof. But we know that uh, in terms of um, reaction that we're hearing from the United Nations and the White House, there has been sort of a script that they're following. They're being very careful with their responses here. Um, the United Nations has sort of said uh, they've kept it very, very brief. They said, we regret this announcement. We're evaluating the next steps here. They've had an office in Venezuela, by the way, since 2019. Um, and both John Kirby and Jean-Pierre uh, have expressed kind of similar concerns, deep concerns over this, not elaborating on any type of specific response, Tom, but saying that they are watching this very closely. And then, you know, we've been covering this, this threat of war between Venezuela and Guyana mm -hmm. pretty closely, right? Venezuela saying that they want to annex these lands that belong to Guyana, very rich oil fields. And now I know there's new reporting that Venezuela is building up forces along the border with Guyana. Yeah, and it's times like this, Tom, when we know that we may not get a straight answer from governments. This is when we rely on images from above. So satellite images have shown us before, particularly with other countries. We've seen this with North Korea. We're seeing this with Venezuela. Those images from above are so telling. So what we're seeing is an increase in military presence in the area. We're seeing an increase in military and armored vehicles around the military bases here. So, Tom, even though there's very little information that we're getting from the Venezuelan government on that front, um, that increase in military presence is definitely very telling and very concerning and again something that the White House is watching closely. Marissa Parra from our Miami studios tonight. Marissa, thank you for that. Now to a check of what else is happening around the world and Global Watch. We start with an update on that oil spill off the coast of Tobago. It's now spreading through the Caribbean. The spill now visible by satellite images. You see it right here. Officials say portions of the spill have now moved 89 miles into the Caribbean Sea, entering into Grenada's waters and could impact Venezuela. Trinidad and Tobago declaring a national emergency last week after spotting oil spilling from an unidentified capsized vessel. Several Caribbean and Central American nations have joined this investigation. Late today, Greece's parliament allowing same-sex marriage in a landmark vote. The change making Greece one of the first Orthodox Christian countries to allow same-sex couples to marry and adopt children. Decades of campaigning by the LGBTQ community leading to a day of joy. However, the motion proving divisive, the far right declaring the bill, quote, anti-Christian. And police in Peru using an unusual Valentine's theme disguise to capture an alleged drug dealer. New video released by police shows an agent in a teddy bear costume with a heart-shaped balloon pretending to be a Valentine's Day gift. The suspect coming out of her home to greet the bear when she was taken into custody. Authorities then finding bags of drugs stored inside the home. Several people were arrested. Didn't see that one coming. Okay, coming up, Paul McCartney reunited with a prized possession, a long-lost bass guitar returned to the Beatles legend after more than five decades. How one man led the charge to track it down and his priceless reaction when it got back to where it once belonged. Welcome back. Tonight we have a big breakthrough in a long-standing rock mystery. Paul McCartney's favorite bass guitar, lost for half a century, now reunited with the lad from Liverpool thanks to the hard work of a group of British investigative journalists. 
NBC Savannah Sellers caught up with the team that cracked the case on how it all came together. It's the iconic instrument that helped start a music revolution. Launching the Beatles from basement performances to superstardom. When we started off, we, we all had guitars. I actually ended up sort of getting lumbered with bass because our bass player left. But the guitar Paul McCartney first played with the Beatles, a 1961 Hofner violin bass, went missing after the recording of Let It Be. The mystery of Sir Paul's favorite instrument now being pieced together for the first time. I think it's a bit like a jigsaw, really. So. All thanks to investigative journalists Scott and Naomi Jones. Late last year, they teamed up with Nick Wass from Hofner Instruments, launching thelostbase.com. Their dogged research, finding it was stolen in 1972 before changing hands. That base, the most important base in the history of rock and roll, the most important base in the history of music, actually changed hands in a London pub for a couple of quid and some free beer. Turns out the guitar stayed in that same family and just 10 miles or so from the music megastar all this time. As news of the search grew louder, they turned it in. This intrepid team found out in a phone call from McCartney himself. What was that moment like? This guy comes on the phone saying, hey, hey, Nick, we've got the bass. Um, we found it. We've, it's been handed in. We've got the bass. And I'm thinking, who's this idiot? But you know who it was. It was Paul. And he, he phoned me up to tell me they, they actually got the bass. McCartney grateful for all the sleuthing and that the bass was back in his hands. I always had faith that I would find it. But sometimes I also thought, well, you know, this thing's been gone so long uh, and nobody's ever seen it. And I did, did often wonder if I was crazy, you know, for looking for <laughs> it. The mystery over. The guitar back to where it always belonged. Savannah Sellers, NBC News. Hi, thanks so much for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.